And good morning, everyone out in internet land. Today, it's a, it's a weekday. I've had such a week. I don't know what day of the week it is. And it doesn't really matter. Because I tell you, it's a little cloudy here in Binghamton, New York. And of course, I don't live in Binghamton. I live in Shenango Bridge. But you know, post office puts it on my all my mail. So might as well be in Binghamton. We will probably get out with the dog. I'll bundle up because it's going to be cold later. And, you know, you're going to find out today, my, my guest today on Smart Conversations with Yvonne DeVita, you're going to find out a little more information about the importance of getting out with that dog occasionally. Oh, not occasionally, every day. So uh, Tom Van Winkle, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Let me tell the, the audience a little bit more about you. <laughs> see if I can All get right. my tongue off my eye teeth and not get myself. Hmm, see what I'm saying. Tom has a degree in mathematics from the University of Illinois, an MBA from Loy Loyola University in Chicago, and is a certified animal behavior consultant. I like that. I mean, people don't understand the importance of, of understanding animal behavior. Maybe we can talk about that. Sure. He has been the CEO of the Hinsdale Humane Society, which operates the Tut Hill Family Pet Rescue and Resource Center in Hinsdale since 2017 and has over 20 years experience in animal welfare. He is also the CEO of the American Association of Pet Parents, which I am a member of. And Tom believes the collaboration among all animal welfare agencies, big and small, will lead to saving the lives of more animals in need. To that end, he currently serves as a board member for the Illinois Animal Welfare Federation, sits on the steering committee for the Chicagoland Life Saving Coalition, and is a member of the Pedigree Foundation Advisory Council. So that's a lot in there, Tom. And I think for the, for the listeners, let's talk about some of the important things happening today and how, how can we who um, are are settled and secure in our homes with our pets, what can we do to help families who are not secure at home and might lose their pets? You're big on keeping pets in the family, aren't you? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, uh, that is of, of paramount importance for several reasons. One, because it obviously keeps a pet with a loving family and a loving family with their pet. It, it keeps the animals out of the, uh, the sheltering system that, as right. you said, I've, I run a shelter. So I you know, I am they're very pro shelter. I love the work we do, but we are not a home. And, um, and so if we can keep uh, pets in their homes, then that means um, more room for those in our shelters that absolutely need to come to us. So I'm a very big proponent of trying to keep animals with their with their families. Um, you know, there's uh, the, the, the best thing people can do is, is to find an organization um, that uh, does the work that meets their personal values and personal missions and support mm -hmm. them in, in any way they can. That, that might be becoming a member, like you just said, of the American Association of Pet Parents. It could be making donations to that organization, whether it's pet food, uh, it could be their time. Uh, there are many organizations that, have, that help with pet food pantries. Um, so uh, that, that always, the, the donation of pet food for, for Hinsdale, for instance, we get donations of pet food that we will then work with um, food pantries that help humans. And we will provide the pet food for the food pantry. So the families yeah. only have one stop. They're going to get food for themselves and their, okay. and their families. They don't have to try to find and go to another stop to go get pet food. It's all right there in one spot. So we act as that intermediary mm -hmm. since uh, we have the connection to the pet families. We can get donations of toys and leashes and food and litter and all that kind of fun stuff and partner with those community-based organizations. So uh, back to your question of what can families do that are they're set, they, I think that they can find a, a group in their area or a national group they want to support and whatever means they you know they can do and, and wish and wish to do what, what's comfortable with them they they can um, help in that way yeah i i oh i hadn't thought about the wonderful thing you just said about how you're working with the pet pantry so it's just a one stop mm -hmm. i mean i've always been um admiring the uh, pet pantries we when we lived in colorado which is why I always complain about Binghamton, oh, Colorado. <laughs> um, when we lived in Colorado, I worked with um, 
the pet pantry there. And that was the first, my first experience, even realizing, wow, there's a place where, you know, people in need can go so that they can feed their pet. Because we know, at least I've heard stories, your, your pet is your more than your companion when we all talk about mm-hmm. how it's part of the family but now you're in dire need and you can barely feed yourself so you're giving half of your food to your pet and you're only eating half and that's just not the way it should be no it should it really shouldn't be we're just taking strides that that next evolution and, and there's obviously nothing wrong with pet food pantry standalone pet food pantries those are wonderful mm-hmm. wonderful and yes. we've we run those ourselves at times too uh it was it just happened to be a, a marriage of uh you know two groups coming together i had, had lunch with a executive director from the the food pantry and she just asked the question do you ever get extra food and we and we said well we have a full trailer out back that we had to rent because we get so many oh. donations that we're looking for places to, that we can help. And she said, oh, guess what? My people are always asking for pet food. Can we, can we have some? And so we make a weekly trip. We, we load our van up weekly and drive over oh. to the pet food, to the human food pantry and, and provide them with the, the pet food supplies or pet supplies. I'm, I'm blown away by that. That is really one of the things I talk about to small business owners is partner, 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 because mm-hmm. there's somebody yeah. out there that you can serve that can help serve you also. Um, so when we talk about pets in need, for instance, and, and families um, in need, how, what kinds of things are you doing to help keep pets in the family when it might look like, oh, we have to take our pet to the shelter. Well, one thing we're trying to do is, is pretty, seems pretty straightforward and simple. And, um, you know, I always say that the internet's a, a blessing and a curse, right? I, yeah. I use the internet. I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm not shouldn't say guilty of it. It's very, very useful. But we have a problem, a challenge nowadays of so much information. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. bad information or fake news or anything like that, but it's just so much information that uh, when you try, when a person tries to find solutions to their problems, they don't know it's it's too much information to digest right they don't know and which so, one they should actually they don't read know which or one. listen to right exactly and and oftentimes again it's fine except that folks we need, need answers in a hurry right they want mm-hmm. something that's mm-hmm. short and sweet you know if my dog right. is eating grass tell me what's going on i don't want to read four pages to figure out what's happening right we, we, we need an answer so mm-hmm. well one thing we're doing for the aapp is to try is to go out and we interview and work with the experts of people that can answer the question, the most common questions pet owners have and bring that in one central source. Mm. Um, I, I, I can't see with my gray hair here. I'm over 50. So I'm a member of the AARP. So I love AARP. And I, the reason I like them so much is because they do that same thing. But for people, as we get older, they're, they're for ways that we can live yeah. healthy and happy lives and keep going. But it might be challenging to find those activities that are right for our age age range. So I can go to AARP and I know it's a trusted source and they will have information for me I need. And that's what we're doing. With pet, that's what we want to do with pet parents. Give them that trusted source that okay. we're doing the research. We aren't the only information. We're not the, you know, there's, there's lots of good information out there, but if someone reads something on our website, they can trust that it is from uh, you know, it, it, it can be trusted to help them with their pet. So that's, that's the one thing we're doing. Right. And then we go all the way through, we're going to um, have programs. Uh, we have a program called Heart and Home. Mm. We're starting to kick off, which is to address the issue of heartworm in the South uh, because mm. of the warm weather heartworm is very prevalent in the Southern States because it stays warm all year round. Mm-hmm. And there are many families that have to give their pets up because heartworm treatment is extraordinarily expensive. Mm. Um over a thousand dollars. And so people can't afford it. So they're giving their pets up simply because they can't afford the treatment. So we're going to start a project with, uh, we're, we're finding a shelter down there in Alabama to work with so that we can say, what if we were to be able to come into a community, provide tests and treatment, keep to help keep the pets mm-hmm. having heartworm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. would we see a, a, a less number showing up in the shelters? Mm-hmm. And those that do show up, do have to go to a shelter for some other reason, if they don't have heartworm, are they getting adopted more quickly? Or are they being able to transfer to another group that can help them more quickly because they don't carry this large price tag with them? 
And that would that so that's another thing we're doing. We're actually putting that membership money. So when people become members, that's what that money is going to be used for is directly back into programs to help families as and pets. So um, when we think about animal shelters or the Humane Society, mm-hmm. nobody thinks about what it costs to run such a place. That is not something. It's just a, it's so sad. We take it for granted. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I can't keep my pet anymore. I'll take it to the Humane Society and they'll take good care of it and someone right. will adopt it. Tell us a little bit about how we could think differently. It, obviously, we can't get into the overall, it's it's this many millions of dollars and whatnot. Um, I'm thinking about there is there are people that you have to pay. There's um, upkeep on the shelter. There's kennels. What are all the things that go into that to help people understand when you take your pet to the shelter? I mean, it's it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Well, it is. And whether it's a, a rescue-based organization that runs uh, volunteer only out of people's homes, or you have large facilities or, or buildings such as mine that um, actually have staff, uh, you know, uh, staffing is a very big part of our budget because I always say, you know, people cause the problems and people solve the problems, the pets mm-hmm. don't. So mm-hmm. we have many wonderful people, adopters, staff, volunteers, board members, et cetera, are doing wonderful, wonderful things, but the animals end up with us because of, of people and we need people to solve the problem, which as you said, staffing, and I have to pay them. Mm-hmm. Um, medical costs for the animals. So if, uh, if, a, if a pet is coming in because it is, um, it is too expensive for a family to take care of, we are incurring those same costs. Mm-hmm. Um, so food, litter, uh, medicine, vaccinations, and then all the way up through, uh, you know, surgeries, we've had amputations. Um, mm-hmm. we, we were just talking briefly about Lily, who's in my office, mm-hmm. that um, she has a pair, she's paralyzed in her back her back end for we don't know why so we have to a specialist looking at her in a couple of weeks to see if we can figure out what's going on well mm-hmm. that's going to be an expensive ordeal mm-hmm. so um those types of things are where it, and of course then copy paper uh, <laughs> promotions right so there's so uh, much that goes into it everything. And, it's, and, yep. and the goal here is for me to say folks it's not free you think when you go to adopt a pet that it's this fun little experience and look at that little dog or that <clears throat> cat and they're going to be so happy and they are going to be happy when you adopt them but really there's more to it than that. So what do you look for when someone comes to adopt a pet? What do you look, what, what do you want me to tell you or share with you before I adopt that pet? Really? It's the the most important thing is um, a realistic view of why, Mm -hmm. of what you're looking for from a pet in your family. Right. So if, uh, if, if you happen to be, uh, you know, I'll go use myself as the example, right? At my time of life, I'm a little more sedentary. I'm not out. I'm not out running races. I'm not doing things that I used to do when I was much younger. So when I was in my 20s and I had a Labrador Retriever, it worked out well. I loved being outside. She loved to run. It worked out great. Right now, a Labrador, a young Labrador Retriever would not be a good match for me personally, even though I absolutely love them to death. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm realistic about what types, you know, how much I work, how much I'm at home, mm-hmm. what I do, what activities I do, right. then that helps the counselors make that right match to say, hey, Tom, yeah, this puppy or this young lab is what you <laughs> love, but really you might want to look at a, at a different dog because it better fits your lifestyle. If you have small children, it, dogs and small children are wonderful. If, you, if you're looking at an 85 pound knucklehead who likes to barrel through walls and you have the small toddlers, you know, it might not be a great match. It doesn't mean the dog is mean. It doesn't mean you're not a good family. It just means that might not be a great match. So really all we're looking for, I think the main, most important thing is a realistic view of what your family structure is, mm-hmm. not good, bad, or indifferent, just so we can match up the, the pet's personality to what you're looking for. And, you know, do you want a couch potato that's going to lay up and watch TV with you? Or are you looking for a, a running partner mm-hmm. that helps us match the families with the best pet for their need? Yeah, I think that's so important. And I think families need to be realistic to the point that you made, especially if you're coming in as a family and you have children, the children need to be 
know a little bit more about what to expect mm -hmm. um, because it it the the fun little TV show family where you had the two parents and the brother and the sister and they adopt a dog and they go home and the dog walks along beside them <laughs> it might might not be the case and especially do you address the fact that be, if a dog's been in a shelter for several months for instance um, that dog has probably has a few issues that you need to work through and it pays to be patient. It pays to um, learn how, we talked a little earlier on in your description of your bio about animal um, behavior. Mm -hmm. How do we teach people to understand animal behavior? Well, um, you know, we don't need everyone to be a, a specialist. I think that right. the important thing that people understand, need to understand is that animals communicate with body language much more than they do verbally, right. which is counterintuitive because we are used to much more verbal mm -hmm. communication. So it's teaching some basic things that if that that when pointed out, most people can see is the dog trying to pull away mm -hmm. or is the kitty trying to get away from you? Mm -hmm. uh, is are they shy? Are their ears down? Are they looking down? Are they turn their head? Little things that if a human did it, then we would pick up on it. If you approached me and I backed away from you and put my and turned my head, you would notice that body language. But we, so we just need to translate that to people with their with their pets and say, oh, when when little Junior here approaches the, the dog and the dog tries to move away, it doesn't mean the dog doesn't like Junior. It just means something is they're just not comfortable in that situation and they need to not expect the dog to. Um, to be bomb proof. You know, we don't, right. I don't, we don't expect perfection out of each other. These are living creatures, living thoughts, living feelings, living fears. They've mm -hmm. lived a past life that we, some what we know about, but not everything. Mm -hmm. So we need to give them that time and, and understanding to say, look, you know, if I always equated that, if you locked me in a prison in a, in a, in a country that I don't speak the language, mm -hmm. right. I'm going to be trying to figure things out from visual cues. Mm -hmm. I'm in a strange place. It's scary. I don't yeah. know who's coming at me, even if they're very, very nice to me. I still mm -hmm. don't understand the situation and I can't understand them. I'm going to use visual cues. And that's mm -hmm. what the dogs are trying to do in their new family. And then, they'll, but they'll right. pick up on it after a while. So you're, I think you hit it right in the head with, with saying patience is the key. Mm -hmm. Most of the animals, you know, they'll come around. It just takes some a little bit longer than others. Yeah. And I, and, and each animal has its own personality. Mm -hmm. So you have Absolutely. to kind of learn that. We um, adopted a beautiful hound dog in Colorado, and he'd been living in a, um, he was a, a laboratory um, dog. Oh, gosh, yeah. And he, he was only a, a food, so it was just a food study for seven years, which is, you know, not a big deal, I guess. But he lived in a cage. He lived in his cage his whole life. He hadn't been on grass. He didn't understand the sliding glass doors. <laughs> it took a long time for us to teach him that. He didn't even yeah. know how to go upstairs. So, you know, I laid on the floor with him for a couple of nights because he was mm -hmm. just pacing and pacing. And he, it was like, where's my bed? I don't understand. Why am I here? And then he got comfortable. And then we adopted his, his best friend from the ranch. They said, oh, he has a friend back at the ranch because it was a shelter that takes um, all the animals out oh, of the, okay. a particular, a particular gotcha. laboratory. And they, they take uh, bunnies and all any animal that's been yep. in there that is instead of being euthanized they go to the ranch um, and then the ranch adopts them out and so uh, when we got Emily she was entirely different she was just very exuberant and she wanted and she still does she wants to be with the people Mm -hmm. she chester was a dog dog he loved other dogs he wanted every time he saw another dog he had to be there but emily isn't she she other dogs are okay but she wants her people yep. so they have different personalities and you you have to so does the you as the um ceo of the shelter and everything um how are you addressing the these the things that we're talking about here to help people who come in, is there a, a class they take? Is there something that you hand them a piece of paper saying, here's, here's how this works. How does it go? Oh, 
Well, a little bit of a little bit of both. I mean, we have um, we do have obedience training classes, so so that would be post adoption, so people mm -hmm. can come back and do obedience training if they like, and my trainer can talk about specific issues they might be having. So it's not just sit, stay, lay down, come okay. here, all that kind of stuff. Okay. If there are specific issues, we do have um, a rack with handouts for specific, you know, particular issues or questions people okay. might have. So if they're experiencing something, um, the big, you know, I always say that, you know, my greatest accomplishment <laughs> as the leader is I hire good people and then I get yeah. out of the way, you know? Uh, so my, my team are the ones who are the real heroes here. So they have those conversations with people. They spend the most time with the dogs and, and cats. And so they kind of see some of those personalities, not all personalities show themselves in the shelter, but right. we kind of can see some of them. So introverted or extroverted, or they might like, or dislike other dogs and things of that nature. My team will, provide that information during mm. the interview process. But then of course we're here afterwards. So we do follow up calls and emails to say, you know, what are you seeing? We're, we're always here to answer questions to help them through that transition. So if they say, gosh, my dog really likes other dogs, but they're not as, you know, attached to me as I, as I was hoping, mm. you know, that's not surprising given the environment and given how they grew up. So give them, you know, they need to need that time. Sometimes people just need that to hear that from someone saying, mm. it's okay, you're doing everything right. Just give it time. Um, so we have all those, we have all those resources available um, here at the, at the, at the shelter. Um, and then we also work with veterinarians, behavior mm. specialists. So if someone has a real issue, we can call on uh, people who are, you know, doing that professionally mm -hmm. and focused on that area and, and make those introductions as well. Yeah, I think it's so important. And in, in what, um, as far as the Humane Society itself, where where you are, your um, your chapter, do you see? Are you seeing a lot of dogs and cats come in? We are a tremendous number. Absolutely, oh. um, we're we're kind of seeing the downside of COVID for for our industry. You know, the the bad side of COVID, of course, was the the pandemic, but we saw record numbers of adoptions last year. So animals were flying out the door all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing now is not, we aren't seeing so much that people who adopted are returning their pets. What we're seeing now as the, the lingering effect of COVID where people are have lost their job, unemployment's back down. Now the eviction uh, moratoriums mm -hmm. are, are ending. So people are finding themselves still struggling either with high medical bills or they're still ill or they're getting sick or whatever. And so this new pressure, the, the, the continued pressure mm -hmm. of COVID is forcing families to have to give them up. And then the second thing we're seeing is that many animals last year were not being picked up as strays because no. places were closed because of COVID or uh, staffing was way down because of COVID. So we had a lot more strays running around and they started having babies. So we have lots and lots of puppies and kittens um, that are being found under porches and in, and in backyards and under cars and things of that nature um, to, that need help. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really, really most every shelter, I own my only shelter colleagues I talk to, there's not one of them that says, Oh, gosh, we yeah, have a we lot have of room. Empty cages, no empty yeah. cages, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah, I used to see on TV, I haven't seen it in a while, like on the new news, especially where they would bring in someone from the sh well, shelter to talk about, oh, and they'd actually have a dog or a cat there that was up for adoption, which I think helps a lot. Um, but how do you, this is a really touchy question. So I want to ask it correctly because I'm <laughs> sure that it's very important to you also. Um, and, and it's almost like you can't, there's no guarantee, but how do you know that the pet is going to a good home? Well, you're right. You can't. It's, can't guarantee right no 100 unless you go my, there right my even then. my my theory my theory is this is that it's it's less about going to a bad home we have less we have less instances going to a bad home and we have than we do with potentially a just a mismatch where we just sent the wrong animal to a good home okay. um and the reason i say that is 
well, one, if you're a, if, if you're a bad home and you're not going to take care of the pet, you're going to, you're just going to abuse them or not take care of them and not love them. Generally speaking, you're not going to come pay me money for that opportunity. You can mm. go to Craigslist, you can go wherever you want and find pets, unfortunately, mm. yeah. to not take care of. Um, so generally speaking, we don't see people that are, that don't have the desire and they have the real willingness. They really want to take care of the pet and do the thing. What we do see is either we make that, that, that we, the match was incorrect. And I won't say we make the bad match. It's just, we just, we just, just uh, the people's expectations that the animal didn't live up to their expectations mm -hmm. or the animal got in the home and didn't, whatever, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, it, the match didn't work out. That happens less than 10% of the time. It doesn't happen very often. Um, because generally speaking, the people come in and during the conversations, we kind of get that to the bottom, you know, the people are very forthcoming because they want to write pet, right? They don't want to come in. Yeah. You know, I've had, we had a few that come in and lie and, and say, mm -hmm. gosh, you know what? I, I mean, we had one lady who came in and she didn't tell us she had 30 cats at home. And oh, um, we didn't find that out till later, you know, so there's, there are some folks that sometimes will right. fib, but for the most part, the families want, you know, they're looking for a happy ending too. So they're going right. to have those conversations. So right. that so doesn't it's a happen. conversation and it's and a conversation. Really, it's, it's a conversation. Right. And there's no, there's never any guarantee no. that this particular animal is going. Uh, and, and I think to our point earlier that we were saying is, um, if, if people who are there to adopt a pet can have some patience. But also, I love what you were talking about the, um, the, the pet parent group and how it's going to help people understand these things mm -hmm. and get good information and the right information and have a trusted resource. Um, because you're right, there's so many places online it's we go to Dr. Google when anything's wrong with us. And yep. so if something's wrong with our pet, we go to Dr. Dr. Google yep. veterinarian and it's not the right thing to do. So I really applaud um, the launching of the American Pet Parents Association. And, and I want to impress people to, to join. It's, it's very low cost. And, you know, the other thing is it builds community, which is a good mm -hmm. thing because the other way to teach um, new pet parents, how to deal with their pet is to talk to other pet parents. Yep. Absolutely. And we have three, we have three feedback mechanisms built in already. One is when you, you probably saw when you're, when you're a member, there's pet posts, just like a Facebook or other types of social media, but it's mm -hmm. just for our little, our little family. So you can, so you can go out there and look at my pictures of Frank, my, my silly dog. And as a member, you can see my, my, my posts and you can react and say things, but we also have a couple of forms. One is through the Courtney's corner and one is through the pet resources page that give people exactly what you're talking about. The chance to say, Hey, I'm struggling with X, Y, Z. Do you know any resources out there? giving us direction on what resources would be helpful, we would go find them. And then we put them on the website for everyone else to see, or just someone to talk to Courtney's corner that, that the piece on there, she is her, that's her job is to engage with our pet parents across the country. So if someone says, Hey, you know, I, I lost my pet. She just passed away. Mm -hmm. I'm really feeling sad. You know, can you help me? You know, what do I, you know, give any suggestions? She has great resources for pet loss groups, mm -hmm. things of that nature, but she can also just have that communication. So we really want um, the association to be a two-way street. It's not us just saying, oh, okay, here's all the information you need. We want parents, pet parents to engage with us and tell us what challenges they have. That lets us Mm -hmm. know exactly what how we can be the most helpful because otherwise it's just me kind of going oh well I, my dog was eating grass yesterday everyone has to have that problem right so, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah I, and I love the the community aspect because um, again when you have a, a peer group that you can refer to and talk to and it's it really helps lift that burden off of your shoulders of, I don't know what to do. You know, my cat isn't eating or my dog is, is pooping in the house again. What's yep. wrong here? And, and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a great, great resource, everyone. And I, I will help, you know, promote it as much as I can, Tom, because I'm really passionate about all the things that we talked about here today. I'm passionate about 
helping America get a handle on, you know, this stray population of pet of, of um, especially cats and dogs. Uh, but before we go, we're kind of at the end of our time. Before we go, what actually got you into this? Tell us a little your of your backstory about how you got into this. Yeah, because you know, from my from my bio, you can see I didn't start out in animals. I, exactly. I started out in finance, and and I I worked for 14 years in the corporate world for some really really great companies they treated me very very well it just did not match what i found was when i went home i, I had something missing from my soul mm -hmm. so i started volunteering at the local shelter to walk dogs just to oh, yeah. try some things and i fell in love with the animals but i also fell in love with the business structure of nonprofit. Nonprofit is to me it's about collaboration about working together i really don't have competitors in my industry as mm -hmm. i see it you know we should be all working together i know people look at it that way some do and you know we're competing for money but truthfully if we do it right that should there should be plenty of money to go around if we do our job the best way we can so mm -hmm. i like that collaborative nature i like the mission-based work we need money i mean again you know that, that's not you know we talked about it earlier nothing's for free so you know i'm the one who has to go out and get those dollars oftentimes but it's all with that mission back so that's how i got involved um 20 plus years ago, mm -hmm. um, went ahead and made the jump from corporate America into running a wow. shelter um, wow. here in the Chicago land area. And I just, you know, this is just where you I belong. Just, yeah, you're happy now. Yeah, so, yes. so tell us, one of the things that I do like to tell people sometimes is we talked earlier about providing pet food to people mm -hmm. in need. There are also other things that the shelter needs besides pet food. Oh, yeah. So I, I um, one of the shelters that we worked with when I was with Blog Paws, the um, influencer community of uh, pet bloggers that I ran, was uh, had a wish list on their yep. website. And the wish list said, we need towels and we need blankets and we need yep. um, Absolutely. cleaning supplies and we need this and that. So do you have one of those on yours? We do. We do have that on our site. And I often and times sometimes people are surprised that we need towels and we need window windex and we need mm -hmm. hand soap and we need toilet paper and we need paper towels and we need all the things same things people need around their house because we have to keep the it's, we're not only cleaning up after the animals but we're cleaning mm -hmm. up after the humans that are here too so mm -hmm. uh, we do have a wish list on our, our website and we keep it updated so that when we get a, a, a big big donations of paper towels we'll move those to the bottom and move things up to the top wow. of so that we can kind of help people focus on where our needs are the greatest again so it's the best use of their donation mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we're getting the best use out of it from our end and people know that they're helping us with the greatest amount of need great great because i think that wish list um i mean at one of them i saw they needed laundry baskets and i'm like who yeah. would i would never think such a thing who I would know. I mean, it would be a great thing to take take your your kids or your grandkids around and collect towels and things from the. We're going to take this to the Humane Society because, yeah, everybody has old towels or a, a laundry basket or something. So that's great. So, so Tom, I'm so happy that we got to do this. I'm so happy to be able to share this because my passion for animals and animal welfare um, it started when I was a little girl, and I'm I'm still involved in it even though my main job is helping people write books um so anytime you're ready to write your book you, you will call me right i will call you okay. i will call you absolutely okay but doubt. at this point um i'm so happy you could be on the show and share this really this is eye-opening and illuminating information because we tend human beings we tend to think everybody knows everything. Everybody knows what I know. Mm -hmm. So I know the things that you and I talked about. Um, but and, and I have learned that not everybody else knows all that stuff. So I'm glad we could do it here today. And um, maybe we'll do it again down the road and have another another show. We would love that. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you being here. I mean, having me here, not you being here, but me being here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is Yvonne DeVita signing off from Smart Conversations. And <clears throat> my guest, Tom Van Winkle from um, the, the Hinsdale um, Humane Society. I was going to say animal shelter. Humane Society. Not the same thing, but the same thing. Yep. And um, he, he, I will have all his contact information and information on how to join the American Pet Product or Pet Parents Association. Um, and, and I recommend it. 
I think you should all, everybody, even if you don't have a pet, join because you <laughs> might have a pet or you have a relative with a pet. So right. it's worthwhile. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.